Friends, uh, let's begin with prayer. God of wonder, our hearts fill with gratitude on this day when at last we can see you again radiating through every face. Here in this place where hearts break and mend, babies are washed in your waters, youth are sent out to serve, hearts become one in the mystery of marriage, and your word is proclaimed in song and speech. May this moment of miracle speak to the hearts of all who gather in body or spirit. May your presence be known among us, and may we receive we who are blessed so that we might be a blessing to all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please rise in body or spirit as we awaken to the grace surrounding us this day and all days. The one who birthed all life created us for relationship. The one who makes healing possible calls us home.
Let us join our hearts in prayer as we acknowledge our need for God's grace. Gracious God, we admit that our lives are full of public discord and private disconnection. We pray for peace, but hardly know how to make peace with ourselves. We give, but we also hold on. Though you ask us to witness to your love, we lose heart when faced with the difficulty of speaking truth. We have been known to silence others for the sake of order and the illusion of peace. Holy One, remind us of the insecurity of true growth. Forgive us for our quest after security. As our hearts lift, keep us off balance enough to be willing to love and serve you. Amen. The promises of God rest on grace, not on our deserving. God restores us to right relationship with our maker, with other persons, and with ourselves. The Holy One blesses us when we cultivate mercy in our own lives. Let us share Christ's peace with one another in signs and smiles without handshakes and hugs. Please, for now, remain near your own seats and continue to keep a safe distance. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Hi friends, peace be with you. Thanks. So uh, one of our scriptures for today is from the Gospel of Mark. So whenever Jesus went, crowds gathered, and everyone loved listening and learning to Jesus. Or did they? There were always religious leaders that were out to get Jesus, kind of set him up. And they, in this passage, the religious leaders claimed that Jesus had an evil spirit. And Jesus said, well, how is that possible? How can I be possessed by an evil spirit and do all of these good things? So, well, as all of this was going on, Jesus' mother, brothers and sisters, came and they wanted to take Jesus home. They felt that Jesus wasn't safe. And Jesus said, when I am with you all, the crowd that he was teaching, it's like you're my family. I'm, I'm one of you. And so for us, following Jesus isn't always going to be easy. People are going to make fun of you, criticize you, and they're going to think that you might be a, a little strange, a little weird. But when we all work together, we can do great things. It's, as if, it's like we're family, and we can do those hard things. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to follow Jesus, even when it's difficult. Help us to work together to spread your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
test. Sorry about that. I know you're wanting me to put the mask back on, but I, just give me a few minutes. Um, I'm here to talk. I represent the campaign committee and want to give you an update on where we are with the campaign. We are coming to a close. Keep the chairs down. Um, our goal has been is $850,000, and we are right now at about 625, 620 or 625, and we feel very confident that we're going to get there, we hope. But anyway, I wanted to say all that. Also, I wanted to say, you know, our church, as you know, our church burned back in the early 2000s, and the decision that had to be made by the session was do we just replace what burned down, in other words, just have exactly what we had before, or do we look at the present of our present of our ministry and also the future of our ministry and build back with that in mind? And that's what happened. Baird Dixon, our own Baird Dixon, was the architect who created all of this, and uh, we've been blessed. And you've heard this before, but two or three of the ministries, uh, I won't go into all of them, but that have been uh, impacted by this uh, redesign has been our ministry to the homeless. We work with uh, Room in the Inn, and we, uh, in this rebuild, we uh, created uh, uh, places where they can wash and dry their clothes and things like that. And uh, uh, the other thing was that uh, the children's ministry of this church has always been important to us, and we created the peaceable kingdom. If you've not seen that, I urge you to go down. It is marvelous. The kids love it. And as David Williams uh, said a few weeks ago in his testimony, uh, we also took in mind of what the choir and the music program of this church needed to flourish, and it certainly has. So if you have not made your pledge yet, I encourage you to do so. Out uh, When you picked up your bulletin, there was a little pledge sheet, uh, and I encourage you to uh, fill that out and put it in the collection plate or give it to me, and I'll add another zero to it. <laughs> Just teasing, folks. But anyway, uh, we've got a lot of work uh, ahead of us. We've got people will be on the phones in the next week or so to call folks who have not made their pledge to see if they're going to join with us. But again, I think the long and short of it is that we feel confident with we've got a good shot to make it. If we don't do it, this means that in three more years, we'll have another campaign. No one wants that. But anyway, thank you. Thank you and keep giving. Please pray with me. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find wisdom, and in your will discover your peace. Amen. Our Hebrew scripture reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 to 11. Listen with me for God's word to us today. So all the Israelite elders got together and went to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, listen, you are old now and your sons don't follow in your footsteps. So appoint us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. It seemed very bad to Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So he prayed to the Lord. The Lord answered Samuel, comply with the people's request. Everything they ask of you because they haven't rejected you. No, they've rejected me as king over them. They are doing to you only what they've been doing to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this very minute, abandoning me and worshiping other gods. So comply with their request, but give them a clear warning, telling them how the king will rule over them. Then Samuel explained everything the Lord had said to the people who were asking for a king. This is how the king will rule over you, Samuel said. He will take your sons and will use them for his chariots and his cavalry and his runners for his chariot. Holy wisdom, 
holy word. Our gospel reading this morning is from the gospel according to Mark as we re-enter the world of Mark and I will be reading from the third chapter beginning with the 20th verse where James has given us a very good introduction. Jesus entered a house, a crowd gathered again so that it was impossible for him and his followers even to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they came to take control of him. They were saying, he's out of his mind. The legal experts came down from Jerusalem. Over and over, they charged, he's possessed by Beelzebul. He throws out demons with the authority of the ruler of demons. When Jesus called them together, he spoke to them in a parable. How can Satan throw Satan out? A kingdom involved in civil war will collapse, and a house torn apart by divisions will collapse. If Satan rebels against himself and is divided, then Satan can't endure. He's done for. No one gets into the house of a strong person and steals anything without first tying up the strong person. Only then can the house be burglarized. I assure you that human beings will be forgiven for everything, for all sins and insults of every kind. But whoever insults the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. That person is guilty of a sin with consequences that last forever. He said this because the legal experts were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. His mother and brothers arrived. They stood outside and sent word to him, calling for him. A crowd was seated around him, and those sent to him said, Look, your mother, brothers, and sisters are outside looking for you. He replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Looking around at those seated around him in a circle, he said, Look, here. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, sister, and mother. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, everywhere, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. In the midst of our celebration, returning to worship as we have known and loved it, our texts today are sobering. They call us to go forward with mindfulness, with heartfulness. While we have been social distancing for more than a year, seismic changes in our world and in our country have been taking place. And of course, we see in the life of Jesus the both and aspect of the nature of the life of faith, able to hold the overflowing joy of life in one hand, while never turning away from its sorrow and injustice, and always seeking a third way so that we, the church, don't buy into the corrosiveness of binary thinking. Even as we celebrate restoration, we remind ourselves to keep asking, how will we lean toward justice and peace now? How can we channel our love, how our play and our work, how can they be grounded in what we have learned over the past year? And I don't think we fully know yet all that we have learned over the past year. First Samuel, which was probably composed earlier than the Genesis creation stories, is about the ancient Hebrews' establishment of their first governing system, their first monarchy. Monarchies were considered the way to protect, advance, and grow kingdoms, usually by domination. First Samuel was likely written in a time of exile as the people looked back on what had been 
and organized their story to go forward, seeking first to establish the legitimacy of their first great monarch, King David. So to get to David, you have to go through Saul, who was the not so great predecessor of David, and you have to look at the great prophet Samuel, who established the powerful priesthood and anointed kings. In this text, we see Samuel trying to persuade the people that God wants to lead them, that God wants to teach them, that they would be better off with God as their leader. They didn't need a king and really wouldn't do well with a king because human kings, they're as flawed as the rest of us. But the people said, no, we want a king. And this has gone on for verses before the verses we read this morning. They said, we want a king. That seems to work for everybody else, and we need to fit in. We want that kind of power. So they refuse Samuel's guidance until God finally says, okay, go ahead. God, over and over, we see God does not coerce. Remembering that most kings do not move the needle toward God's gracious order, we then go to the gospel where Jesus, who embodies the reign of God, is slamming into that same human resistance. Jesus says, God's reign is close at hand. Indeed, it has dawned. It is in your hands. Let's do this. But do the people welcome this news? No. All hell breaks loose. His own family thinks he has lost his mind. I'm going to be a little less generous than James was. His own family thinks he's lost his mind. The religious authorities come down from above to expose Jesus as a follower of the devil, Satan. Hierarchy, patriarchy, supremacy, all the things we're talking about today move in and surround Jesus and the people. Even his family are drawn right in. Any of us can get caught up in these powerful reactions to things that seem despicable. And yet, ever grounded, able to speak with reason and wisdom, Jesus says, Satan? Beelzebub? How can Satan cast himself out? Who is my family? And why should I align with them if they are not seeing the truth? about me, about God, about life. The reign of God is the opposite of the re reality his family had adjusted to, the reality of empire, not unlike monarchy. We make our peace with the system we're born into, at least at first. Empire in Jesus' time and empire in our time cannot exist without the scaffolds of enslavement, the displacement of opposition, the silencing of resistance, the division of people. So I'm struck today by the synchronicity of this pairing of texts with our re-entry from pandemic. We are reminded that the place where we find ourselves today is an old place, an ancient place. It has its own wrappings, its own set of distortions, its own beauty its own history, and many of us are trying to do our part to continue the hard work of clarification that began while we were living a different reality these last 14 or so months. We have had a moment, historically speaking, to pull away and reflect, and we have begun a process of remembering the parts of our past we need to own now as we live into the call for justice, especially racial justice today. I was fortunate this week, this past week, to attend an online presentation by Brian McLaren, who visited Second right here several years ago and whose writing and research today digs deep into the divisions in our country, especially the rise of authoritarianism. Authoritarianism refers to systems in which power is vested in a single, unquestioned individual who controls the levers of government without accountability to a greater good or a public need. Brian is a theologian and speaker whose spirituality was honed 
in the evangelical church, but who has become a leading voice in progressive Christianity in the 21st century. He's worried these days about the rise of authoritarian voters who will cast their votes as directed by this kind of leader he describes. Brian connects this phenomenon in our time with factors such as innate bias, the ways we learn to think and perceive the world through family and culture, which means that we miss things. We learn to think the way the people around us think, and sometimes that means having to spend years dismantling our thinking once we become aware of the gaps and the embellishments. While voters in the United States have tended to fall into about four groupings, as he describes it, who hold common values such as progressives, liberals, conservatives, and traditional voters, Brian McLaren sees a fifth set of voters rising today, which he calls authoritarian voters. These voters value the centralizing of power in one individual, one party, or network, in order, he writes, to defeat a real or concocted enemy, because winning is their ultimate value. They do whatever is necessary to win, including distorting or hiding the truth, breaking norms and rules, and suppressing dissent, because winning is their prime directive Lying, cheating, colluding with foreign adversaries, and using violence and violent threats are not seen as moral failures, but rather acceptable tactics. What happens to Jesus in this passage, what is being conveyed by the writers of both Hebrew and Greek scriptures, falls along these lines. As McLaren says, we can get drawn into patterns of distorted seeing and hearing before we even know what's happening. In that troubling statement of Jesus, who is my mother, my brothers, Jesus is not diminishing the importance of family, but he is, he is completely alone. He's flying solo as he sees through the biases, the fears, and the conventionality that, that distorts his family's view and his community's view. You don't have to read Brian's books or any other book to know that our world is getting more divided as well as harder to deal with. And the pandemic has made that very clear. How will we respond to the world we're walking into now? Here at Second, where will we put our energies going forward? Today, we're dealing with more than one pandemic. And if we are Jesus people, communities of faith, our call is to walk as boldly and as fearlessly as possible. Affordable child care, accessible health care, public education, access to mental health assistance, gun laws, so many of our systems are failing, and the breakdown has been coming for years. COVID has brought them even more clearly into view. Our younger generations, graduates, new parents, 40-somethings, 50 and 60-somethings, staring down retirement, basically most of us are confronting questions about the future, which will require new responses, new ways of engaging, new ways of working together, confessing our own blind spots, holding ourselves at least somewhat accountable for some of the wrongs we denounce in the echo chambers of social media and community. This past week, my husband Mike told me about a retired Jewish doctor who he knows through an online interfaith group, which Mike has been part of since COVID began. The doctor's name is Frank. Frank's father was a hat manufacturer in Germany when Frank was a child in the 1930s. The anti-Semitism then, along with a boycott of Jewish businesses, forced Frank's dad to close his hat business and take the family to America in 1938. They were, of course, among the fortunate ones to be able to come here. For years, Frank's favorite hat store 
in Nashville was Hatworks, which, to put it mildly, has been in the news lately. Hatworks is owned by Gigi Gaskins. Frank and Gigi know each other, but only through their business transactions over the years. A couple of weeks ago, as some of you clearly know, a photo of Gigi smiling and holding up a yellow star of David 